the section of Psalms that we're in, we've examined Psalm 95, 96, 98, all dealing with singing as an act of worship and praise to God. And in the midst of that, uh, Psalm 97 and 99, dealing with the sovereignty of God. And we come across two more psalms here addressing the act of singing as a, an act of worship towards God. And a, a song obviously used in the uh, public worship assembly of the, uh, the Israelites. And as we have uh, <coughs> sang here today in our song service, Songs that have uh, been closely related with uh, not just Psalm 100, but Psalm 148 and other psalms. Uh, many of uh, our psalms today uh, take their cue, if you will, from, from the book of Psalms. And uh, there's great meaning in the words and great meaning in the message. Obviously, why God wanted the individuals in that day and time to sing these words. And... Though in the Old Testament, under the old law, mechanical instruments of music were used in addition to singing, and at times God commanded specific mechanical instruments to be used with particular songs, in the New Testament uh, there is no command to use mechanical instrument of music. There is no example of anyone using a mechanical instrument of music in worship. There is uh, no instance in which individuals worshipped with mechanical instruments in the New Testament. There is no authority whatsoever for using a mechanical instrument of music in worship. And many times uh, when individuals today seek authority, they go back to the Old Testament and sometimes, uh, or perhaps most of the time, to the book of Psalms which is a, a book that uh, is written for our learning, Romans 15, verse 4, but does not give us authority for how we worship today. But even at that, I want to point out that though mechanical instruments of music were sometimes mentioned even in the Psalms, you won't find a psalm devoted totally to a mechanical instrument of music. You know, we just pointed out a few of the psalms we've looked at in the past several months as we've gone through the book of Psalms. And you'll see in Psalm 95, Come, let us sing to the Lord. Psalm 96, O sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord. Bless His name. Psalm 98, O sing unto the Lord. And now Psalm 100, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. You won't find a psalm that is devoted to a mechanical instrument of music. And it's interesting that sometimes uh, people emphasize things that God never intended to be emphasized. And that takes place uh, today even among things that God did authorize. For instance, uh, God authorized us to partake of unleavened bread and grape juice as a memorial to remember the Lord's death until He come. And we commemorate that every first day of the week as we've been authorized. There are, there's a command to partake of the Lord's Supper every Sunday. There's example, which is authoritative, where individuals every Sunday in the first century uh, and in the New Testament took of the Lord's Supper. But people want to emphasize sometimes the unleavened bread and the grape juice to use it at weddings and birthdays and other sorts of uh, events and almost uh, elevate it to a position that God never intended. And that, I think the same thing happens with the mechanical instrument of music. They go back to Psalms and other Old Testament passages and they say, look, there's a mechanical instrument of music. And they act as if that's the one thing God wanted us to know about. Some piano or a, or a psaltery or a harper or something, right? 
It seems to me if you look through the book of Psalms, it wasn't a psaltery or a harp that God wanted us to remember. It wanted, he wants us to sing. God wanted His people to sing to Him. And you know why? Because the soul of a harp is not going to do any good for God. God's not interested in a soul. You know why? Because a harp doesn't have a soul. You know why God's so interested in humans? Because they have a soul. And God wants to have a relationship with you. He doesn't have a relationship with a psaltery or a harp. It's an inanimate object. It was made by the hands of men. It's just brass or metal. The soul of man, God, created in the image of Himself. Right? And so He wants to have a relationship with humans. And so that's why He emphasizes, people come to Me. Sing. I want to hear your voices. I made them. I want to hear them. And so in uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, we have the command to sing. And Ephesians 5, verse 19, the command to sing. And uh, obviously that's the only authority we have in New Testament worship as it pertains to music, is to sing. But if people want to go back to the Old Testament, it seems very obvious that what God emphasized was the relationship between man and God, not some inanimate object. Even though in the Old Testament that inanimate object was authorized at times and sometimes commanded. But that wasn't the emphasis of the worship. It was the singing. It was the relationship that that Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. How many pianos or organs or harps make joyful noises? They don't make a joyful noise. They don't have a sound that sounds happy. And you can make a sound that sounds sad with a piano or whatever. But they don't have any emotion at all. That emotion is determined by us. Right? And since we're individuals, sometimes we have differences of opinion on what sounds sad, what sounds good, what sounds bad, right? You listen to the radio today, and I would say most of it's bad, <laughs> right? But there's some people that enjoy it. They say, this is good music. I might contend that it's not music at all. It's just a bunch of noise. But that, that, the, the, the music itself made by those mechanical instruments, they don't have emotion. We determine whether we think it's good, bad, sounds uh, sad or happy, right? Those emotions. So to make a joyful noise in the Lord is a, is a relationship only humans can participate in. With it. And of course, a joyful noise means that we're making a noise uh, because of happiness, because of cheerfulness, because of joy. And we have reason to be happy and a reason to be cheerful and a reason uh, to sing these songs to the Lord. And he explains that in the latter part of this psalm. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Obviously, singing emphasized. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. So here's the first reason why we should be joyful, why we should come before Him singing uh, with, in His presence, and why we should be glad and happy. Because He is God. It is He that made us, not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. All humans uh, owe their existence to God, even if they don't like God, even if they hate God, even if they deny God. They owe their existence to God. Uh, Paul wrote to the church at Romans and said there would be a day that even the, the atheists would bow down before God and confess His name. Because God is worthy of that truth. God is worthy of that, that act. And so we didn't bring about ourselves. And you know, we could go through a whole logical argument and a discussion about that you know this is as logical as it gets we didn't come from ourselves we didn't create and if we did create we can't create ourselves right that's impossible and so uh, you could go back in that sense and debate evolutionary theory we know that the world exists right and we know that it's impossible for the world to have created itself. So there had to have been something before the world 
in order to create it. We know that uh, there's uh, no way for the earth to have been created out of nothing, so something had to be before the earth. God's getting at that here. Why should we sing to God? Why should we be, bring forth a joyful noise? Why should we be glad? You know that the Lord is God. <laughs> He's getting at the point that God is eternal. God is supreme. There's no one above God, right? There's no one before God. Without God, there is nothing. But because of God, there is everything. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So then he gets into not just our, is God the creator of all things, but that he is the protector and a sustainer of people, right? God expects us to work while we're here on this earth and to labor with our hands. One of the punishments for sin in the Garden of Eden, if you'll go back that far, that we would tend the land, right? And we would take care of the land and we'd provide for ourselves. But where did all that stuff come from that man is supposed to provide for himself? It came from God, right? Where did the seed come from? The herbs, the grasses, the trees, the water, it all came from God, right? Yes, man is to protect that and, to, and, uh, and use it to his benefit to provide for his needs and to work with it, but it came from God. God provided us with all the things that we need. So today, he provides us with everything we need spiritually. All our spiritual needs have been provided for. All the things that we need to know that pertain to life and godliness have been given to us, the Apostle Peter writes. The sheep of his pasture, a shepherd. We sang the song about Jesus being our shepherd. Jesus has given us his word, and in his word we know uh, where the pitfalls are. We know places and people and things to avoid. He guides us, doesn't he? Like a, a, sh a shepherd guides his sheep. He guards us in letting us know where we need to build up defenses, walls and fences uh, to keep wolves out, for instance, right? And to be ever watchful and vigilant for certain things, uh, not to allow them to creep in, right? That's how we're protected and provided for today in defense. Those are reasons we should sing a joyful noise to the Lord, right? Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. So here another reason we should uh, be cheerful and glad in our singing. It is because of all the good things that he's provided us with. We should be thankful to the Lord. We should be thankful for the very fact that God uh, kept a relationship with man, right? There are some that believe that uh, God is and God created, but then he just left man to his own devices and doesn't have anything to do with him. Uh, deism. Well, you know, that's a very uncomforting, uh, uncomfortable theory, isn't it? That there's this great super being, but he doesn't want to have anything to do with us. No, the Bible says we can enter into his gates. He even says... Come before His presence and sit. God wants to hear us. He wants to see us. He wants to hear our voices open. He wants us to be actively worshiping Him, in other words. Don't just come and sit. Right? You know, a lot of people think worship just means go sit in the building for a while. Put on a coat and tie and sit. No, that's not worship. Worship is actively coming to God. Being in His presence. Singing. Being cheerful. Being glad. Being thankful is a part of worship here in verse 4. We should be thankful because God wants to hear from us. He wants us to come to His presence. And, and the fact that we can come before His presence, even more so today than in the Old Testament when there was a high priest only who would go into the, uh, the, the most holy place of the temple to offer blood sacrifices uh, for the sins of the people once a year. And then there were the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood we talked about a little bit this morning. Only they could go into the holy place aspect of the temple. 
And so, uh, yes, the people were represented before God, but they themselves never really entered. They had representatives. When Jesus died on the cross, that curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place was rent in two. In other words, there was, there was nothing dividing people from God. They could enter into his gates in the sense that they could come before God and do what uh, God would have them to do. But even more so today, we don't have priests or intermediaries that go between us and God. Jesus broke all that down. We can go straight to God uh, with our prayers. We can go straight to God with our songs and praise and our worship because Jesus broke that down. He was the intermediary. And that one-time intermediation took place at the cross. When he died on the cross, it was broken down. The veil was rent. So we should come before him in praise and thankfulness because he wants to hear from us. And we have the, we have the uh, permission to come to God. And that should bring us, uh, make us thankful. Verse 5, for the Lord is good. Another reason we should be cheerful and glad and and want to sing praises to his name, the Lord is good. You know, sometimes we use the word good. Uh, well, most of the time we use the word good uh, almost in a generic sense, right? Uh, when the Bible says God is good, it doesn't mean, well, he's good most of the time or good some of the time, right? God is good. That's by definition good. And... To be good, by definition, means that you're never bad, right? You might say, well, that restaurant, that's my favorite restaurant because their food is good. But you, you, you might go one day and it might be bad. God's never bad. God's always good because that's by definition God is good. So to be good means there's no bad, there's no darkness involved. Everything that is good surrounds God. And so when we think of God as being good, it's not how we think of good in a generic sense today. God is everything good. He is always good. There's never a time when there's no good in Him. For that reason, we can look to Him to understand what we need to do in order to be right with Him. We can know what good is. We can know what wrong is. If it contrasts or it contradicts His very nature or very existence, we know that it's not good. And when we need help and when, we, uh, when, we, when we're not joyful, when we're not cheerful, when we're not glad, when we're not happy, do we want to go to a source that is not good? No, that would, th those sources would only bring more pain, right? More, more turmoil. We want to go to a source that is always good. That source is God. Verse 5 also says, His mercy is everlasting. We've talked about mercy quite a bit in the past uh, few weeks in our Bible classes and in sermons. And mercy obviously being a, a, a judicial term, if you will, uh, dealing with uh, those who are guilty of a crime or guilty of, uh, of breaking a law. In the spiritual sense, guilty of a sin. Uh, obviously, uh, the Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when you come before a judge in a courtroom, even in our physical state, in our physical situation, when you come before a judge, you want, two, you want one of two things. You either want to be innocent or you want to have mercy. Well, the Bible says we've all sinned, so we're not innocent. So we better hope for mercy, right? <laughs> Well, the Bible says, sing praises to the Lord. Come to Him with cheerfulness and gladness. Why? Because His mercy is everlasting. You know, like, you never, you know, you, uh, some, uh, some attorneys might say, well, we don't want to show up before Judge A because that judge, no mercy. And you might say, well, you know, I'd rather go before Judge B because if he's having a good day, you never know. You might get some mercy. When we go before the judge of heaven, we always know he's full of mercy. His mercy is everlasting. Now, his mercy only extends as far as our obedience to him goes. 
God requires our obedience in order for us to appropriate his mercy. But if we'll hear his word and we'll believe it and we'll do what he says to do, we can obtain mercy. We can obtain mercy. See, there's a difference between giving unconditional mercy and then a person doing what's necessary to obtain mercy. But the point here is, is that His mercy is everlasting. In other words, if you're still alive today, you still have hope. You still have hope. You might say, well, I've never, not one day, received the mercy of God because I've never heard His Word, I've never believed it, and I've never done a thing He said. You still have hope today. (laughs) Because if you'll hear His Word today, believe it, and obey it, you can obtain His mercy. It didn't run out. Now, when this life is over, the mercy runs out. But until we die, or the end of time, we still have hope because of that mercy. We're all guilty of sin. But we can obtain mercy if we'll do what God says to do. That's a reason to be joyful, isn't it? His truth endures to all generations. That's important too. Because how would we know how to obtain mercy if He didn't provide us the truth? The truth is His Word, John 17, verse 17. We look to His Word. We look to truth. The truth can make us free, John 8, 31 and 32, if we continue in His Word. His truth endures until the end of time. And we know what He wants. It never changes. It never gets additions to or subtractions from. It endures. People have tried to change the Word of God. We read of people burning the Word of God. We we read of people cutting it into pieces. Uh, Many people today pick and choose things out of the Word of God and teach it and leave the rest for the dogs. But if you'll pick up those pieces that have been cut, if you'll go back into the flames where there's some ash and you start reading, it's still true. (laughs) Right? All those words are still true. And the Bible says in John 12, verse 48, it's by that word that we'll be judged on the last day. God's word's going to be there on the last day. There are a lot of books that won't be. Almost every book that you've ever read will not be there. But there will be one book that will be there. It doesn't matter how many times they try to rip it up, shred it, burn it, it'll be there. Because they can't get rid of it. That's a book we want to depend on, isn't it? The truth. If you, if you know that that book's going to make it through all the wars... Through all the hurricanes, fires, floods, and evil men, that's a book we can depend on. His truth endures to all generations. If you knew that uh, this book may not last through next week, why would you put your faith in that book? But if you know you've got a book that's going to last till the end of time, that's a book to put your faith in. For that reason, we should be joyful and cheerful and glad. And we can make a joyful noise unto the Lord. These are reasons that we sing to God. This makes our singing uh, more active as an act of worship, doesn't it? We're not just doing something to take up time. We're not just doing, you might say, well, I enjoy that part of worship. I like to sing. It's not just for that reason. There's a reason for our singing. There's a purpose behind it. And it's to remind us of all these good things, isn't it? And it, uh, it's different from other acts of worship in that it involves so much of our being, our emotion, cheerful, gladness. And it involves our voices. And not only does it involve one voice, the Bible says singing to yourselves psalms and hymns, spiritual songs. It's reciprocal. I'm singing, you're singing. Somebody else sing. We're all singing individually. But not only are we singing individually, we're singing collectively. So I hear your singing, you hear my singing. And from the standpoint of the microphone, you just hear one song being sung. But there may be hundreds of us singing it, right? <laughs> well, that's, a, that's different from basically any other act of worship that that it, that a, that applies to us individually. And so it brings us closer to God, if you will. 
So we, uh, we look at Psalm 100 and we close it out. And we remind ourselves uh, that we should put all we have into every act of our worship, whether it be prayer, and we're going to talk about that in another psalm coming soon. Uh, but singing and listening and teaching and preaching and giving, partaking of the Lord's Supper, those acts are all equally important to our worship. <clears throat> but we can learn a lot from what God told these folks in the Old Testament uh, to help us even today. If you want your singing uh, to be cheerful and glad, you need to know the truth uh, and you need to obey the truth because that's what brings forth that joy and cheer as we sing. And if you want that uh, singing to be accepted by God as, a, as an act of worship, then we want to make sure that we're right with God in order for our worship to be pleasing to Him. And that takes place when we obey His Word. We hear Him, we believe it, we repent of our sins, we confess Jesus to be the Christ, we're baptized in water to have our past sins washed away, we become clean and pure from that sin, and God adds us to his church, where as a church, as a body, we worship together. We bring forth a joyful noise. And we'll be doing that as long as we have the opportunity in this life, and we will sing before the throne of God one day if we're faithful to the end in heaven, making a joyful noise. If you have already obeyed the gospel, then... Uh, if you have any other need, we're here to assist you as well as we stand and sing. <clears throat> Would you live for Jesus?